But we've got our family day here today, having Burevos rolls and kids on the jumping castles afterwards. And so I thought I'd just take a moment to share something for us as a, a community and as Harvest family. And I want to talk about hospitality. I want to talk about what it means to be a church that carries the welcome of God. And even as I was spending some time preparing, I was just so aware that one of our main uh, things that we hold to and believe for here at Harvest is to see lives touched, changed, and transformed. And when we carry this welcome in our heart, it enables people to come here and to experience that. In their coming, in their experiencing that welcome, lives are touched and changed. And so when people drive past and there's that single mother and she sees this building on this hill, that there would be something that draws her because of the presence of God here, that even though that she's a single mother and might have some unruly children, she knows that that's a place that can welcome me. When there's that man that comes and he's full of tattoos from neck to toe, and he's wondering where can he go and engage that he won't, in a sense, feel like an outsider, he'll know this is a place I can go to that'll carry a welcome and an acceptance for who I am. When those, those people that are coming that maybe are dealing with insecurities, maybe addictions, maybe various things, that they know there's a place that they can go. Maybe it's the wealthy couple who comes, but in their heart there's something missing, and they're thinking, where can I land? That this house would carry something of the presence of God, the welcome of God, that invites people in, that they can find belonging and know what it means to be engaged with family and a part of family. That's what we desire for harvest, even as we know that's the expression of the gospel message. And we see that in that wonderful scripture that we all know so well, John 3, 16. I apologize, I've had no voice for this week, so it might seem a little bit uh, rough as I'm sharing, so I'll try and keep my voice a bit lower than usual. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And here's the beauty of it. It's this, it's this word, so, for God so loved the world, I just love that word so. It's so emphatic. It carries so much meaning. It carries so much weight. It's not just that he loved the world. He so loved the world that he gave his son. He gave out, he out gave himself in a sense because we know that, that the, the Godhead is one. And in the same way as we come here, not only does God so love the world, but he wants us to be a community that we can say to people that God so loves them and that they are so welcome. We want it to be a house, a community, a family that says, you are so welcome. And it's something we desire for ourselves. Because whether you've been here for 20 years or whether it's your first time here today, you want to know that you're welcome. You want to know that you have value. You want to know that there's a sense of belonging. You want to know that it matters that you are here, that people recognize that and people celebrate that. And so we see that here in the heartbeat of God. Because it's more than just something that we're wanting. It's something that expresses his very heart. The God that we serve, as we look throughout Scripture, He's a God that lives towards us. He's a God that pursues us. He's a God that embraces us. He's a God that sees us at a distance. No matter what shaped us, no matter what situation we're coming out from, no matter what stained us, He sees us at a distance and He runs to us. His initiative is to greet us and to draw us in. We'll see that a little bit later. That's the heart of God. It's a heart of God and it's the heart of welcome. It says it in 1 John 4 verse 12, and we can put that scripture on the screen. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. And if you read those two verses together, there's something that comes out as a challenge to us. The first thing is this, no one has ever seen God. What that means is we can understand in and of ourselves we don't get to see him. No one has been able to do that. No matter if they're the worst of sinners seated on the back row or whether they're the most saintly of people sitting on the front row of performance and whatever it must be, might be, no one has got to see God. But here we see that Jesus came and he came to make God known. He went to heaven. He's seated at the right hand of the Father and he's saying, no one has seen God, but if you love, if you love, then you make him known. He's saying there's something about the working of love in our hearts. There's something about if we allow love to work in us, it's the transforming work of the Holy Spirit that completes something in us that is at this moment not yet complete and full. And his love doesn't only work in us, but it starts to have an, its expression through us that others can come to know God because of this love. We read earlier in that same verse in 1 John 4, in that same chapter, that it says God is love. 
And so there's something about when we are allowing ourselves to receive his love, but also to allow that outflow of his love that it causes people to know him. It says this word, make known, to make him known. And it's an amazing word. If you look at it in the Greek, and if you studied the word or consider yourself a Bible student, you would know this word. That word make known means to exegete means to exegete, and uh, that exegesis or exegete means this. When you take a passage of scripture or a word and you do not impose your own interpretation on it, you don't put your own worldview or mindset on it, but you work with the original language. You work with the original thought, with the context that it comes from, both historically and culturally, and you dig down into the text so that you can bring out the original meaning. That's what it's saying that Jesus does in his love. That's what it's saying that we can do as we allow his love to work in us and through us. We make known. Jesus came to make known the true nature, the purpose, and the heartbeat of God. He exegeted God's heart, which means he removed all worldly interpretations and thoughts and the way we see things. He peeled that all back and he showed us God in his fullness, God in his um, character, in his nature, in his personality. And what we get from that is we get to see that God so loves us. That's what Jesus modeled. For God so loved, Jesus came to reveal that to us. And he also came to reveal that we are so welcome. It's this radical, extravagant, costly love that's been extended to you and me, revealing the heartbeat of God. It's not this, it's, it's uh, Jesus coming and saying, God is like this, not like this. And the religious leaders of the day, they, they couldn't stand this and they hated it because they had been teaching or trying to exegete, if it were, the law, the requirements, the behavior patterns. And they had started to think that the law and studying the law and revealing the law was actually revealing God's character and his nature and his purpose when it was never meant to be that. You see, the law came in as a way for God to be able to interact, this holy God, with fallen humanity. But it all shifted when Jesus came, because Jesus came full of grace and full of truth. But the religious leader of the law, as it said in that verse, the law came through Moses. They were so caught up with the law and what they thought it revealed about who God was, that he was an authoritarian, that was pedantic, that was a nitpicker, that was a rule keeper, that was saying to you, you have to live like this, you have to look like this, you have to do that, that they missed Jesus exegeting the Father heart of God, arriving full of grace and truth and saying, this is the character, this is the nature, this is the personality, this is the Father heart of God being manifested to you right here, right now, that he so loves you and you are so welcome. But they couldn't catch sight of that. They couldn't see that. And Jesus comes and he wants to make that known and he starts to tell stories that, that outwork and that exegete the Father heart of God. He starts to speak in and through his life of, of God's desire and the Father's house is meant to be a place of prayer and he turns over the tables in the courtyards because he wants us to know that there's nothing to keep us at a distance or to extort us from being able to worship and be intimate in our relationship with God. He also starts to say, speaks about the Father heart of God scoring, the, sc scoring across the hillsides looking for that one lost sheep. He's got a heart that goes out for the one. He starts to speak of the prodigal son that beautiful passage of scripture where there's this kid who forfeits everything that was given to him. He breaks all the rules. He wastes all the wealth of his father. And then he lands himself up in a situation where he thinks I've got nowhere else to turn. Maybe I can go back to my father's house and maybe I can work as a hired hand and there'll be some bread for me to eat. He's thinking of this. He's got a, in a sense, a pharisaical view of what, who the father is. And so he starts to head down the road back to the father. And as he's going there with this thought, maybe I can be hired, maybe I can find some bread. There's something of a God, there's something of a father as Jesus relates the story that so loves, that so welcomes, that the father's on the stoop, the veranda, the porch, whatever it might be. And he's looking in the distance and he sees his wayward son walking back and he runs to him. He doesn't wait for his son to say, can I have some bread? Can you hire me? But he falls upon him on his neck and starts to kiss him and starts to embrace him. The son didn't have to be hired for a day's wage, but he was braced in the full measure of what it means to be a son. He didn't need some bread because he was getting the fattened calf and roast potatoes. And the father starts to give him his robe, his sandals, his signet, his signet ring, because there's something of the father's heart that Jesus is wanting us to see, that for God so loved us, 
that we are so welcome. And what does that mean in our life and through our life as we carry the welcome of God for those that have been distant and far off? Luke 15 in the message says this, a lot of men and women of doubtful reputation were hanging around Jesus, listening intently. The Pharisees and the religious scholars were not pleased. They were not pleased at all. They growled. He takes in sinners and eats meals with them, treating them like old friends. You see, there's something radical, there's something costly, there's something extravagant of the welcome that was in Jesus' heart for those that gathered around him. As we're heading out, wherever we might be placed, is there something about your life and mine that those that are of doubtful reputation, those that most other people wouldn't want to be near, those that most other people wouldn't want to share a meal with, those that most other people wouldn't want to be on the same side of the street with, is there something about your life and mine that's carrying such an expression because of the love working in us and through us, such an expression of the completeness and the, and the Father heart of God that people are being drawn because they realize there is love coming from us and they realize there's a welcome in, a, in us for who they are. Is there that taking place? Because even as we're looking at this word hospitality and welcome, if you look in the Greek, the word hospitality is the word, and I'm going to read it so I get it right, philiozina. Philiozina. Philio means love. And zina speaks of those who are other, far off, or foreigner, or different. That's what it speaks of. That word zina is where we get xenophobia from. Same word, it's the opposite of uh, hospitality. Philozenia is love for the person who's other, stranger and distant. Xenophobia is a fear of others that are different. And you see, something's taken place in this city where we've been known as a city where xenophobia has been rampant. We've had those moments before. But who's gonna change that? Who's gonna shift that? If it isn't the kingdom men and women of God, the community of God that says we've got a different culture, that's counterculture, that's going to replace that, and it's going to speak of something different so that the headlights no longer read Durban xenophobia, xenophobia running rampant, but it starts to read there's something of a hospitality in the city that people who feel far off and distant and strangers are drawn to it because they feel so loved and so welcomed. If it doesn't start here, if it doesn't start with you and me as kingdom men and women of God who've experienced this love, who are ambassadors of this love, where is it going to start? That's the challenge and that's the encouragement that comes because Jesus has exegeted the Father heart of God. He's made it knowing and now the challenge comes, the charge comes to you and to me, to us as harvest, to this community. Will you exegete the Father heart of God? Will you allow people to know that they are so loved? Will you create a space and a place that communicates you are so welcome even if no one else will have meals with you, even if you're not accepted, even if you feel you don't belong, even if you feel that there's no one to stand by you. There is a place, there is a community, there is an expression of my heartbeat in Durban North, and there are many more than that, but that people can come to. That we can have this confidence, not only you and me, but me and you, that I can invite people here, and if, you, if they meet you, they're not going to be judged and condemned and weighed up and looked through a scale of that they're good enough, but you're going to see something of the image of God in them, and you're going to want to celebrate them, not just tolerate them, and I know that they're going to encounter that atmosphere of heaven that we sang about, because it's real here in your life and mine and with us as a community. Are we wanting that? That sort of confidence and the heartbeat of God expressed in and through our lives as we do community and we do life together. You see, there's something of that that when that takes place, it radiates. Then we become a city on a hill. Then people know we're a place of refuge. Then they know that they are drawn here because of the life that it carries. And this hospitality that I'm talking about, this love for others who are strangers that might be foreigners and far off, it's, uh, it's wrapped up, as I say, in hospitality. And we've got a, I can say, maybe I've got a Western way of thinking about hospitality. You know, hospitality in a Western mindset is this. You can come to my house for three hours. I'm fine if you arrive late, but you better leave early. Otherwise, I'm going to let you know it. Can we put that cartoon up? This is some of our ideas of hospitality. Let me read it to you. Sorry, I couldn't get a better quality version. It says, the Arnolds feign death until the Wagners, sensing the sudden awkwardness, are compelled to leave. 
You see, sometimes our Western hospitality is a little bit like that, you know. If you overstay your welcome, we will let you know, and people are driven out. But there's nothing of that that speaks of a biblical hospitality. You know, if we look today, I guess the picture we'd look at, Martha Stewart would be kind of the, the, the poster person for hospitality, but that's got nothing to do with a, a, a biblical view of hospitality. That sort of hospitality says you need to have everything right. Your house better be in order. You better be dressed immaculately. The air conditioner better be set. There better be that little spray that, to create the right fragrance, and you better have the meal prepared perfectly at a perfectly set table, and all of us are so busy trying to get there that we never invite anyone around. That's a, a Western sort of hospitality, but a biblical hospitality is this. It speaks of the Bedouin culture that we see all through Genesis leading into the New Testament, and this is what biblical hospitality is described as, and I love it. It's persu persuading strangers to stay yet another night. Stay yet another night. Persuading strangers to stay yet another night. What it's saying is, I've got room for you in my life and in my house. Not just that you visit and pass through, but I want there to be something of a hospitality that you can know that you can stay yet another night. So it was the moment at the well where they would interact with each other and they would say, come over to my house and the person would come. And then they'd say, I need to go now. Now, no, stay a bit longer. Stay a bit longer. Why don't you stay the night? There was something of that um, hospitality that went beyond just formality but here's the, the the point i'm wanting to get to there's something of a divine hospitality god's hospitality that goes even further than that this is god's hospita hospitality pursuing enemies to win them with a costly love willing to die for them in order to adopt them as sons and daughters of heaven to come and to live in your house forever that's divine hospitality. They say, your theologians will say that the chief attribute of God, the chief quality of God that defines him most is hospitality. It's the sense that he pursues sinners and enemies, people who have hated him, been at enmity with him, not to hurt them, not to punish them, but to die for them in order that they can be sons and daughters of God, that they might come and live in his house, that they might live in the Father's house forever and ever and ever. What a beautiful picture of hospitality that is out of the heart of God. And we can see it out of this picture of a hospital. It's the one word that really still carries that phrase today. And when you look at a hospital, Jesus says this in Mark 2 verse 17, it is not the healthy you need a doctor, but the sick. And I wonder if we carry that same desire as a house, as we're having our family day out here, as we're in a moment of change, as new people are coming and visiting, because there's something of an expression of the heartbeat of God in this place. I wonder if we carry that culture that when people come in here, we are more like uh, those that are more like the headmaster than the hospital more like the school environment than the hospital, seeing do you match up, are you dressed correctly, are you behaving correctly, do you meet all the standards, or is there something in us that when people come and maybe they're hurt, maybe they're broken, maybe they're a little bit bloodied, maybe everything is not clinically perfect in their life, is there something in our hearts that makes space for that? Because Jesus says it's not, it says not the healthy you need a doctor, it's the ones who are sick. When you walk into the hospital and you've just got the cut little toe, they say, won't you wait here a bit? Won't you make a little bit of space? Just take your seat just for a moment because there's someone that's broken, bleeding, battered, and we're gonna get the surgeons around this people, person now. Is there something in our hearts to make space for that? Because if we make space for that, I wanna say we're gonna see such life transformation. We're gonna see such rescue. We're gonna see such people taken out of darkness and established in light, Some, such wholeness where people are able to receive love, that they become whole, that they become the full expression of that, that they can show love to others. It's gonna be an amazing place to be here in this community if that's gonna be our heartbeat and our culture. And so my challenge is this, let's commit to move beyond just Western style hospitality to that biblical hospitality where we persuade the, stray, the stranger, the person who's a, bit, a little bit different, the foreigner, stay a little bit longer. But let's not stop there. Let's be those 
that pursue those that have been at enmity with us, those that have been far off, those that have been different. Let's be those that pursue them and draw them in so that they can know what it means to be a son and daughter, that they have a father, that they have a family to belong to, that they've got value, that they've got worth, that they deserve to be celebrated and not just tolerated. Let's have that sort of hospitality, that sort of love burning in our hearts to reach out. And if we start to live like that, I want to say it's going to change communities around us. And don't worry, you might be thinking, what is this going to do to my life? Well, you know, I've grown up in a household, my mom was reminding me, where um, we once had a, someone you met on the beach who you didn't know, who had no home to be, and he came and lived with us for how long? A couple of months. We had another family who came for a month to stay because they had nowhere else to go and they st landed up living with us for two years. We've, we've had people come all the time and I've been shifted. You know, you talk about um, the chairs being moved. Imagine coming home and realize your room's been given to someone else and now you're sleeping in your parents' room. It's a little bit embarrassing when you're 18. No, I'm joking, I wasn't 18. I was just a kid. How does that affect us? Well, I want to tell you how it's affected me. It's affected me in such a way that my heart is not caught up on temporary things that might, I might think are mine. This is my room. That's my place to sit. That's my. I'm not caught up with the this is mine, this is mine. I'm caught up with he is mine. And everything else can shift because I'm living for him. And it changes your perspective, the way you live. And it's not going to harm your family. Let me tell you, it's going to catch them up with the thing that's of greatest importance. I'm not saying there needs, not, doesn't need to be healthy boundaries in that. But it's boundaries to give life, not to keep life out. It's boundaries to create safety and bring people into a safe place, not to keep them at arm's length. These sort of things happen when we carry the hospitality of God in our hearts. That's how we exegete God and we make him known. And there's this other word in the New Testament that goes hand in hand with hospitality and welcome. And it's this word aspazoma. It's a Greek word and it means greet. And when you read it, you might just pass by it. We see it in a lot of um, Paul's letters. He speaks about greeting and greet. But there's something when we come to the book of Romans that makes us realize that there's a little bit more to this word. You see, when we see Paul writing to the book of Romans and we're in chapter 16, he mentions this word greet over, over 22 times in this one chapter. I mean, if you read it, it's almost like word after word after word, greet, 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 greet. And you think he must have an incredible heart for these people. But if you look a little bit deeper into his writing, you realize that Paul's never visited there before. He hasn't yet met them. It's not like his other letters where he's reading to challenge them or they've been in sin or that he's been reminding them of some theological truth they might live by. That's not happening here. What the letter of Romans, it's pure theology. It's him expressing and wanting to make God known. It's saying this is what the heart of God is like. This is what his nature is like. It's that while we were yet sinners, he came pursuing us. He came chasing after us. He came to welcome us. He came to embrace us. And Romans goes through this. But in the last chapter, it starts to say this word greet over and over and over, almost like a Gatling gun shooting it at us, that you've got to look a little bit deeper and see what it means. And when you look at it, this word greet there is not how we normally greet. Remember, this is with people he hasn't yet met. It's not how we normally greet in Western society. I'm speaking to myself. But when you greet someone, it's like a little hand gesture. Hi, how are you doing? This is a different sort of word. This word here, that's aspazomai. It's this word. It's to, Ron, you've got to model this out for me. I should, I should come for you. It's to arms spread wide. It's a, it's a hug and embrace and a holy kiss. Give me a holy kiss. It's a holy kiss. Thank you, Ron. That was a bigger kiss than I was anticipating. That was a little bit beyond holy. Holy kiss. <laughs> There's something of this embrace. There's something of this welcome. There's something of this greeting that can be seen out of the norm. It's out of, it's not usual. It's beyond that. There's something more than that. It's this expression of this God of love in his heart and working in me, bringing a completeness, bringing in, uh, something of a, an outworking of that, an expression of that, 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 that love reaches out and it, it impacts people. It touches people. 
It's the heart of God that's radical, that's costly, that's extravagant, that sometimes seems against the convention of the day, but it's a totally redeeming love. It's the heart of the father that runs to the prodigals, that runs to those that are far off, that chases down the enemies to bring them into relationship of what it means to be sons and daughters. There's something of the hospitality of God that breaks down walls, that breaks down obstructions, that, that breaks down any dividing thing that can come. It's chasing you down. Therefore, God so loved that he said, he still loves, he still sends, and he still welcomes. It's the expensivity of his heart towards you and me. And Jesus came and he exegeted, he made this original nature, the heart of God, he made it real, available, and visible, and tangible to us. But he now calls you and me, and he now calls us harvest. And he says, are you going to exegete the heart of God? Are you going to receive that love? Are you going to allow the Spirit to transform you into the image of Christ so that you can too express that love? Are we going to allow that to happen? I trust we are. And so I want to challenge you with two things. The first thing is this. Can we move away from a Western-styled hospitality to a biblical hospitality? Can we be those that start to make time in our life? Can I ask you, are you willing, just uh, before you leave this place, maybe there's someone that you've seen, maybe it's been for years, Maybe they look new to you today, but you know I haven't yet greeted them or met them. Can we ship that and change that? That's crazy for family. We should greet, we should interact, we should get to know each other. Can I encourage you before you, amen. Can I encourage you before you leave this place? Joy is gonna get you. Who said that, amen? Was it joy? I guess it was. Joy is gonna get you and joy is gonna get you. Why don't you greet someone? Why don't you get to know someone? Won't you invite someone to your home this week? Won't you make time, be it the three hours or whatever that might look like, to really be carrying the, hospi the hospitality of God? And the second thing I want to encourage you is this, and you can turn to the next the person next to you, and you can say this, you are officially recognized in this church. Say it to them. You are officially recognized in this church as an unofficial greeter. What that means is you might not have the badge, you might not have the lanyard, but you are charged to greet anyone and everyone you see walking past you. And I'm not just talking, not necessarily with a holy kiss of love. Because they've got to receive it in that way for it to be a holy kiss of love. But, but just with warm embrace, with sincerity of heart, with authenticity, greeting them with that same love that you are experiencing in God and letting it wash over their lives as well. Will you accept that charge? I want to finish and pray there and just release you as a community to, to spend time with each other.